women as substitute, women as complement, two stories on the gendered Shinto priesthood in post-war Japan. So with that, Dana, I'll let you take it over and uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. All right. So um, thank you so much for attending whatever time of day it is for you in whatever part of the world you're in. Um, I'm Dana Marsalis. I'm a PhD candidate at Harvard University. And today I'm gonna to be presenting on two stories that we can tell about the gendered Shinto priesthood in post-war Japan. Um, this is a section of my dissertation, which is currently in progress. So I welcome your feedback, your comments, your questions. Um, if we don't get to your question in Q&A, feel free to reach out to me either via email or via Twitter. Um, I've put the contact info on the slide right here. So um, to get started, let me give you a little bit of background on the history of female priests. So women have been serving in Shinto shrines basically since the beginning of recorded history. Um, but in 1871, the Dajokan, the Council of State, restricted shrine lineages to men over the age of 20, and they eliminated hereditary shrine lineages. Now they did this because at that time, priests were designated as government officials, thus the restriction. Now this stayed in place until 1946, when after World War II, the newly formed Jinja Honcho, the Association of Shinto Shrines, opened up positions below head priest to women. And then in 1947, they opened up the position of head priest to women as well. So women could so serve in any position in the priesthood. At the time, they said that there were two reasons to do this. The first was to open the way to uh, the widows of priests who died in the war. And the second was for gender equality, danjo biodo. Now remember this, it will be important later. So currently, a little over 16% of the priesthood in Japan is female. Um, as you can see in this graph, the number of women in the priesthood actually peaked in 2000, or sorry, the number of men in the priesthood peaked in 2000 and has been declining ever since, well, whereas the number of women in the priesthood increases every year. So when I'm talking about female priests, I'm talking about two terms in Japanese, either joshi shinshoku or jose shinshoku. These both refer to priests who are women. I'm not talking about miko, um, which is a different ritualist class. If you watch anime, uh, here is a handy diagram for you. If you're thinking of any character who you think might be a female priest in anime, it's probably actually a Miko. So what's the difference between these two roles? Well, a female priest is a priest who is a woman. So she is a priest. That means she has certification as a priest. There are three ways to get certification. The first is you can do a four-year program at a Shinto university. It's sort of the equivalent of a bachelor's degree. The second is that you can do a one-year program. This is after you've gotten a BA, so sort of equivalent to a master's. And then the third way is that you do a one-month intensive crash course. Now, the big difference between these is that if you graduate from the four-year or the one-year program, you get placed as either a third or fourth rank. Um, depending on what type of program you do. Um, whereas if you do the one month course, you have to take one one month course for each level of certification. You have to be a rank two to serve as a head priest. Again, remember this, this will be important. Um, priests can work full time or part time and priests can be men or women. So priest is a gender neutral category. Miko, on the other hand, have no certification. Um, they tend to only be part-time. Um, at large shrines, they may have full-time Miko, um, but they tend to have a mandatory retirement age if they're full-time, so you have to retire once you hit 25. And Miko are only ever women. There's no male equivalent of Miko. So that's the difference between those two. 
So you might then be wondering, what do Shinto priests do? Well, at all shrines, they perform ceremonies for the shrine. So these are festivals, daily rituals to uh, tend to the kami, the deities that are enshrined in the shrine. Um, they may also perform ceremonies for individual prayers. So if you're, it's your unlucky year, your yakudoshi, you may go to the shrine to have a purification rite performed. If you buy a new car, you may want your car purified. Or if you are building a new house, you may ask a priest to come and purify the land before the house is built. Now, this is what priests do at big shrines. And a lot of the time when we're talking about Shinto, people wind up just talking about the big shrines. So up here on the left, you have Meiji Shrine in uh, Tokyo. On the right, you have Ise Shrine in Mie Prefecture. And then down at the bottom, you have Fushimi Inari in Kyoto. And at these shrines, they'll often employ dozens of priests and priests mainly serve ritual functions. But a lot of the sites that I study are these much smaller shrines. So these are two sort of prototypical neighborhood shrines. They're both in Aichi Prefecture. Both happen to be staffed by female priests. Um, and they will often only have one or two priests, maybe three working there. They may not be able to support a full-time priest. Um, and the roles that a priest may have to serve may be much larger because they don't have administrative assistance uh, to take care of things for them. So at smaller shrines, priests may also have to take care of the shrine grounds. So cleaning, groundskeeping, upkeep of buildings, they might have to unplug the toilets themselves, crafting ritual objects, all those uh, shide, the zigzag paper decorations that you see hanging from ropes at shrines, those often have to be crafted by hand. Um, they may have to repair their own clothes. They're maybe in charge of shrine administration, so doing the finances for the shrine, doing the taxes, organizing the parishioners, organizing the non-ritual aspects of festivals. So things like who is going to provide the food? Um, how are we going to get these lanterns? Who's going to write all the characters on these lanterns? They may also be involved in community outreach. So running or hosting community programming. This may mean having a children's group that meets at the shrine or reaching out to local elementary schools to have them come do a visit. Um, or interfacing with community organizations, so providing space for community organizations to meet. So before I go into the main part of my talk, I wanna talk a little bit about the methods that I'm using, and you'll see shortly why this is important. Um, so classically, I use uh, archival research. This means that I look at a lot of documents. Um, this means publications. Uh, different newspapers that are put out by Jinjo Honcho, um, publications that are put out by female priest associations, interviews with people, uh, notes from different round tables, and a lot of looking at PDFs of scans that I've done. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of PDFs. But I also do ethnographic fieldwork. Um, and what this means in this case is that I've been doing fieldwork with one particular shrine in Nagoya, um, since 2011, so they've known me almost 10 years now. Um, and often what doing field work for me means at that main site is that I basically am an intern at the shrine. Um, so I, uh, I do the kinds of chores that uh, have to be done around the shrine. I wash dishes, I unplug gutters, I have clean toilets, I have made hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of shide. Um, and occasionally I help out at ritual occasions too. So this image in the middle is um, me helping out at a ground purification ceremony. I've also uh, sat in on or participated in priest training courses. Um, so on the right here, this is, I participated in part of a one month training course. And then on the left, this is uh, sitting in on one of the four-year training courses. Um, and I've also done a lot of interviews with priests, both male and female, mostly female, um, with women who took certification but were unable to find jobs as priests after graduation, and also with students who are hoping to become priests in the future. 
And this is important because our methods shape the stories that we can tell. And today I'm pre presenting about stories. So this is Yamashita-san. For the record, any uh, names that I use for specific people um, are gonna be pseudonyms, but let's call her Yamashita-san. She's the head priest of my main field site. Um, and this is a picture of her when she became head priest. Um, they, she was written up in the newspaper because she was the first woman who had ever been a priest at this shrine. So I can tell you that story. Or I can tell you the story of Yamashita-san um, getting ready for the first uh, prayer that's coming in in the morning. They were coming in for an individual ceremony. And you can see her here and she's uh, penciling in the last few lines because she didn't have time to write it in ink. Or I can tell you about Yamashita-san who is a delightful older lady and who loves the Dakuma and who is absolutely delightful with the Miko and loves taking these very strange and goofy pictures with them and who also invited a foreign researcher into her shrine and told me, uh, I'm going to be your Japanese grandmother because you don't have a grandmother here. And all of these are stories about the same person but they're all stories that are told from a particular vantage point. So on that note, I'm gonna tell you two stories about the gendered Shinto priesthood in post-war Japan. So here's story number one, which is about women as a substitute. Now, this is a story that's told from the vantage point of Jinja Honcho. They're the Association of Shinto Shrines. Um, they are an umbrella organization that oversees about 80,000 shrines in Japan and has about 21,000 priests working for them. When I'm talking about Jinja Honcho and their opinions, I'm mainly talking about opinions that are put forth in publications by Jinja Honcho, in conferences that were organized by them, or in priest training course man, uh, training manuals. Um, and these opinions are put forth mainly by three groups of people. Um, the first is professors at Shinto universities, the second is priests at, uh, head priests at large shrines. And the third is administrators of Jinja Honcho. And I should note that there's a lot of overlap between these three categories. Often people move between them or maybe holding more than one position at a time. So you may remember that I told you that when women were first allowed into the priesthood, the argument, part of the argument was that they were allowed in in order to promote gender equality. Now, you may be unsurprised if you're familiar with Jinja Honcho to hear that that argument winds up basically being dropped after about 1950. They don't really talk about gender equality with regards to female priests anymore. This is unsurprising because Jinja Honcho on the whole tends to have quite conservative gender norms. Um, so just to name some causes that they've thrown themselves behind, they are against allowing female emperors, they're against gender-free education, and they're against a revision to the marital law, which would allow men and women to have separate last names. Instead, female priests tend to be positioned as part of or related to the successor problem, the kokeisha mondai. Um, what is the successor problem? Well, it's a problem that is related to a demographic shift that's currently occurring in Shinto which is related to the demographic shifts which are occurring in Japanese society as a whole. So in this image, you can see the percentage change in the number of priests from 1955 to, 19, to 2015. Um, and you'll notice that the number of priests has actually risen in most prefectures, while the number of head priests has decreased. Now what's happening here is that large shrines, their staffs have generally expanded so one shrine may employ 25 priests or 20 priests, whereas smaller shrines have generally fallen out of a head priest's hands. Um, so there are fewer head priests to take care of the same number of shrines. This has led to an issue called Kenmusha. So a Kenmusha is a subsidiary shrine. It's a shrine that is being taken care of by a head priest, but is not their main site. So you may have a main shrine and then you may have three or four or five kenmusha that you're taking care of. And if you look at this graph, you can see that on average nationally, uh, 
Each head priest is responsible for about nine shrines um, with pretty substantial geographical variation. If you're one of the poor priests in Toyama, you may be taking care of a lot more than that. In Osaka, you're probably doing all right. Um, I've interviewed people who are taking care of 22 Kenlusha. So if you imagine that you're taking care of 22 shrines and each shrine has at least one ceremony a month, you can very quickly see how this becomes a pretty big time sink. Now, this is related to another issue, which is the fact that in the 1990s and 2000s and continuing to the present day, uh, prefectures have started doing these surveys to see how many head priests have successors. So have someone who they know will take over in the next generation. And somewhere between 65 and 75% of priests, depending on the prefecture, have said, yes, I have a successor. This means that we're looking at possibly something like 30% of shrines going unstaffed in the next generation. Now, if you think about this with the Ken Musa problem, let's say you have 100 shrines in an area that are being taken care of by 10 priests, and three of those priests don't find someone in the next generation to take over, that means you have 30 shrines now that don't have anyone taking care of them that need to be dis distributed between the remaining seven priests. So this is potentially a huge, huge issue. Now, the successor problem is being caused basically by three things. The first is an economic problem. Less than 25% of priests gain 100% of their income from being a priest. This means that either you have to work a second or a third job in order to be a priest, or you can become a full-time priest after you retire and you're living off of your pension. The second is it's a family occupation problem. So 85% of successors are the children of the current head priest and another 8% are relatives. So if you think about demographic shifts that are occurring in Japan as a whole, as birth rates decline, if there are fewer children, that means that there are fewer people to potentially take over. The third problem is a time problem. So you may remember that I said that in order to get certified as a head priest, you need to take that one month crash course twice. Well, that means that you have to be able to be working a job that will allow you to take 30 days off two times, 30 consecutive days. And that's really, really, really difficult to find, which means that a lot of people just can't get that certification. So as a result, female priests wind up being talked about as part of the successor problem. So when we talk about female priests or when we hear people talking about female priests, they tend to be talked about as a last resort or they're pinch hitters. They're a trend to be tolerated, but not encouraged. So they say, well, it's good that we have these women who are able to fill, fulfill a deficit in male labor, but we sh shouldn't encourage an expansion in the number of female priests. They tend to be assumed to be the daughters and wives of priests. So either they're the only daughter of priests, of a priest who they don't have any brothers who can take over, or they're the wife of a priest who's passed away and they need to take care of the shrine until their son comes of age. Um, they also tend to be talked about as ensuring continuity of the patriline as interim successors and as warding off non-hereditary succession. Now, this means that the assumption is while well, a shrine may pass into a woman's hands, as soon as an eligible man comes of age, it will pass out of her hands. So as soon as that son is old enough to inherit, the mother will step down and let the son take over. And then finally, they tend to be talked about as economic at economically advantageous, specifically relying on women's uncompensated or poorly compensated domestic labor. And so this is looking at a formulation where there's a husband and a wife. They're both priests, they're serving together. The husband works a full-time job. He's only able to work at the shrine on weekends when he has work off, whereas the wife is working at the shrine all week long because the assumption is otherwise she would just be a housewife so this is just sort of an extension of her housewife duties. Now, one place that we can see how female priests are being talked about and talked to is by looking at publications that are put out by female priest associations. So these are two of them. 
Um, there are female priest associations in almost every prefecture at this point. But a lot of these publications tend to have essays that are written by, again, these high ranking uh, priests at large shrines or uh, Jinjo Honcho administrators or professors of Shinto studies. And they're usually written aimed at female priests and trying to give them some kind of advice or encouragement. So this is a sort of prototypical example of what that often looks like. So this is um, the, at the time, head of Aichi Prefecture branch of Jinjo Honcho. And he says, there should be absolutely no gender discrimination. However, I think it is good if there is differentiation. There is reason to think that male and female priests are of the same rank, but do not have the same nature. It is my dearest wish that female priests each leverage their special characteristics and engage in activities. And this is just like such a perfect distillation of all of those essays you will read. You have this idea that men and women are inherently different and that to erase that difference is wrong. Um, and because of that inherent difference, it means that women have to engage in their duties in a different way than male priests do. A lot of the time you see these two phrases appear. Um, so tokse o ikasu, which is leveraging special characteristics, or jose nara dewa, if you are a woman, you can X. Um, so the two things that tend to come up in these sources that are written by Jinja Honcho administrators or priests at large shrines tend to be that women have the special characteristic of being mothers. Um, so they say one thing that you can contribute to the priesthood is you can give birth to the next generation of priests. Um, and then the second thing is that women are more detail oriented than men. And so they will be able to see things in a different way than men can and also use their mothering abilities or those mothering characteristics to prevent the disillusion of families in Japan. Now, how this sort of essential difference actually winds up being handled is an interesting topic. I'm gonna briefly introduce you to a couple of things. Um, so first, there are different ritual technique guidelines and uh, vestment guidelines for men and women. So if you can see on the diagram on the left, men and women actually wear different clothes and carry different ritual implements. So you'll notice men carry the shaku, it's a flat bamboo stick, um, whereas women carry the bonbori, which is a fan. Um, you'll also notice that men and women literally move through space differently. So women have to take an extra step when executing a 180 degree turn because women aren't supposed to open their legs at more than a 90 degree angle. You'll also notice that women keep their feet together uh, whereas men have them slightly open. Now, what's interesting is that originally ritual technique for men and women was the same. Uh, it only became differentiated in 1971, so 25 years after women entered the priesthood. And the architect of these reforms was this gentleman, Ono Kazuteru, who was a professor at Kokugaku University who taught ritual technique. Um, and you can see in this quote here, he says, I always felt terribly resistant to making the girls do the boys technique. I say that rituals express the most appropriate words and behavior for people's hearts. So I want boys to move in masculine ways and girls to move in feminine ones. So here again, you have this sense of essential difference and therefore you need some way to actually differentiate them and express that by making them move in different ways. You also see these ideas expressed in this document, which was uh, a report put together by the Basic Shrine Problems Research Group in 1998, who sat down and figured out the nine biggest problems they felt were facing contemporary Shinto. And number seven of those was the female priest problem. And they identified three things as particular points of issue. One was the lack of clarity around menstrual pollution, which I'm gonna talk about more in a second. And then the second and third wind up boiling down to basically the sense of tension that they feel between 
Jean Jo Honcho's fairly conservative gender norms that want women to be in the home and want uh, women and men to be essentially different and a society, a Japanese society, which at that time was moving toward very strongly discouraging gender discrimination, especially in the labor force. And so they were asking, how do we make these two dissonant things consonant? So to very briefly talk about menstrual pollution, uh, as some of you may know, uh, menstrual taboos have existed in Japan for quite a while, um, but they were technically officially eliminated by the Meiji government in the 19th century. Jinja Honcho has never actually made a statement either way. Um, they haven't either said, yes, we're upholding the Meiji decision or no, the Meiji government was wrong, menstrual pollution is still a thing. This ambiguity has actually caused a lot of confusion. So at one of these conferences on the successor problem, during the round table, um, one of the participants got up and said, I can't believe that we have female priests when menstrual pollution is such a huge problem, we shouldn't have female priests at all. And then a different participant stood up and immediately jumped down his throat and said, what are you talking about? Don't you know the Meiji government actually eliminated these taboos? This is, this is a done decision. Why are you even having this conversation? But despite this sort of constant confusion around it, um, all attempts to resolve the issue have failed. So that basic shrine problems research group actually tried to resolve it and wasn't able to. I think that it's worth noting that the ambiguity may be productive for Jinja Honcho in the sense that if they say menstrual pollution does exist, then the question becomes, well, how can you allow female priests? Is that not a theological issue? and they're going to have to make a bunch of legislation around that. Whereas if they say menstrual pollution doesn't exist, then the question becomes, well, then why are you treating female priests the way that you are? Going back to that uh, dissonance between Jinjo Honcho's gender norms and uh, labor law, which strongly discourages discrimination, um, a lot of major shrines refuse to hire women and this is important because major shrines are the primary employers of priests who aren't from shrine lineages. Um, if you are from a shrine lineage and you graduate with your certification, you can easily go back to your family shrine and take over. Whereas if you don't have a family shrine to go back to, your best chance is to be hired by a Meiji shrine or a Fushimi Inari. But a lot of these sites refuse to hire women. So this is a quote from um, the at the time head priest of Aichi Gokoku Shrine, which is the second biggest shrine in Nagoya. And I'm not going to read this whole quote because it's quite long, um, but he's basically saying he thinks that it's appropriate for women to serve as priests when they're doing so in order to protect the family. So in those sort of cases of there's only one daughter who can take over or the wife dies or the husband dies and the wife has to take over, he thinks that's appropriate. But he says that Hiring women at his shrine, which isn't a family lineage, is inappropriate because that will obstruct them from becoming wives, which is their real destiny. And so he says, I cannot consent to the ambitions of women who wish to become female priests. Um, and what this has led to is this sort of interesting thing where female priests are positioned as necessary because there aren't enough men. But if you actually look at numbers of head priests, you'll notice that in the post-war period, um, over 50% of men have served as head priests. And you'll notice that decline here. That's because of the Ken Musha issue that I was mentioning earlier, where there are fewer men serving as head priest and more that are serving at major shrines. Women, on the other hand, consistently across the entire post-war period, about 20% of them serve as head priests. That means that 80% of female priests are serving underneath someone, they're supplementing their labor. And if you actually look at numbers, female priests are not really offsetting the decline in the number of male head priests. Instead, what they're doing is they're there to bolster men who have other uh, commitments or who are doing that sort of work full time only on the shrine on weekends situation. So that's the end of that story. 
you have a very easy narrative of women being an inferior substitute, um, that women are here basically to replace a failing male labor force, um, and that their womanhood has to be managed. Um, and that's it, open and shut case. Okay, just kidding. Here's where everything gets really messy. So here's our second story, which is about women as a complement. So first, let's interrogate some of these claims that we might think uh, Jinja Honcho is making about gender and the priesthood. So you may remember that I said that um, ritual technique and vestments are gender segregated. Well, here is an image of two priests at my main field site. On the left, you may recognize Yamashita-san. On the right, we have Okada-san. Now, if you look at them closely, Yamashita-san is wearing male clothing and she's carrying a shaku, which is a male implement. Okada-san is wearing female clothing and she's carrying a bonbori, which is the female fan. Now, what is happening here? You'll also notice Yamashita-san is wearing the female headgear. So mixing and matching here. So what is happening here is that when Yamashita-san took her certification course, there were only three women in the course and they were given the option of either learning male technique or learning female technique. And the three of them didn't wanna be separated from their classmates and they didn't wanna make extra trouble for the teachers. So they decided to all learn male technique. So Yamashita-san has technically only ever learned male technique she uses male technique um, and she is wearing male clothing because she inherited all the clothes from the previous head priest, didn't really want to buy an entirely new set of clothes. And so she just uses male clothes. Okada-san on the other hand took her certification course more recently. Um, it was fully gender segregated. There were more than three women in the course. So she has only ever learned female technique and she bought her own clothes and her own fan and so she uses them. And this is very, very common among my interviewees, um, people who mix and match, who might wear different types of clothes for different occasions. I have had a number of people tell me that when they go to a uh, festival outside of the shrine, so if they're doing a ground purification ceremony, they will wear male clothes because if they wear female clothes, people don't recognize them. They don't know what they are because they don't see those clothes and think priest. They've had uh, one woman told me that she had gone dressed in the female clothes and someone said, why did they send a Miko? Um, at some shrines, uh, if there's only one woman, she may opt to wear male clothing just so that she doesn't stand out. Or it may be for economic reasons that they inherited them from the previous priest and they don't wanna buy new clothes. There's a lot of different reasons why people may mix and match. Some people really, really hate the female clothes. Some people really, really hate the male clothes. Some people like one technique more than the other. So there's a lot more sort of fluidity in those demarcations than you might think just by looking at the training manuals. So what about menstrual pollution? Well, um, like I said, uh, Jinja Honcho is quite ambiguous in whether it exists or not, which means that there's a lot of grounds for interpretation. So at my main field site, Okada-san is the youngest of the priests, and so she's like my senpai, and she makes sure that I don't mess up or uh, violate etiquette in some way. So she's always sort of pulling me aside to teach me things. Um, and so early in my field work, she pulled me aside one day and she said, oh, Dana-chan, are you going to be on your period soon? And I said, well, it's gonna be in a couple of weeks, but um, is there something I have to do? And she said, oh, well, you're, when you're on your period, let me know, and I will make you a little packet of salt, and you can put it in your sleeve, and that will cancel out the menstrual pollution. Yamashita-san, meanwhile, overhears this, and she goes, what? What? Have you been doing that? And Okada-san's like, yeah, I do that every time I menstruate. And Yamashita-san's like, you can't do that. It doesn't work like that. Why are you telling her this? It doesn't work like that. Um, and they proceed to get into a little bit of a tiff where Okada-san is saying, well, when you became a priest, you were already postmenopausal. You never had to worry about this. Do you want me to just call out when I'm menstruating? And Yamashita-san is saying, well, you shouldn't be going into the honden, the main building when you're menstruating. You need to be way more careful than you have been. 
Meanwhile, the third priest is sitting in the back um, and she turns to me and she goes, I don't do anything. I don't think that menstrual pollution is really a problem. And it turned out that all three of them had been operating off of the assumption that all the others were on the same page. And this is really, really common. Different priests have different strategies for dealing with menstrual pollution. They may carry an object on them. They may perform a purification ceremony. They may avoid going into certain spaces or performing certain activities, or they may believe that it's not an issue and do nothing at all. Um, it's also worth noting that obviously not all women menstruate, not all people who menstruate are women. And that is something that female priests tend to be a lot more aware of than Jinja Honcho administrators in that there tends to be quite a distinction made between priests who are menstruating, priests who are not, priests who are postmenopausal, um, which often gets written out when people are worrying about whether female priests should be allowed because of menstrual pollution. And it's also worth noting that how people deal with menstrual pollution is influenced by conditions of the shrine as much as theology. If you're the only priest who works there, it's really, really hard to take menstrual leave. Um, so you may instead opt to carry something on you or to perform a purification ritual or to do nothing at all. Um, and information on menstrual pollution is disseminated informally without Jinja Honcho's oversight or knowledge. So, now that we understand that things are a little more complicated, let's go back to the building blocks. So Jincho Honcho thinks that uh, female priests are mainly wives and daughters. So this is looking at my interviewees. I can break them into basically three groups. The first group is people who are born into shrine families. Their parents are priests, sometimes their uncle is a priest, um, it may not be a direct relation, but they're, they have a relative who is a priest. Now, there are basically two types here. One is uh, ones who are supporting or assisting their family. So it may be a situation where there is a um, father, his daughter, and daughter's husband serving as a priest, or father, daughter, other daughter, son serving as a priest, father, mother, son, there are all kinds of combinations where it's a whole family that's working together. The second narrative is the sort of Jinja Honcho standard narrative, the sole successor, where there is a daughter, there's only one daughter, there's only daughters, or all the other siblings flee and only the daughter remains. Um, the second type is people who marry into shrine families. So their husband is a priest or their husband is in a priestly lineage. Their husband may not necessarily have taken certification. So again, here there are two models. First is those who are supporting or assisting family. So it may be a case where a husband and wife are priests or where a father-in-law, a husband and a wife are priests. Or the second model is when they're serving instead of their husband. And this is the sort of prototypical widow serving as a priest, but it might also be the case that the wife marries into the family, the in-laws say, all right, time for the son to take the priest uh, certification, and the son goes to his wife and says, hey, can you take it instead of me? I really don't want to be a priest. So there are a bunch of different ways that the situation can shake out. And then the third group, which Jinja Honcho doesn't really ever talk about, are people from ordinary families. So they don't have any relatives who are priests. They're not married into a priestly line. Um, and there are a bunch of different reasons why people may wind up becoming interested in the priesthood. Um, in what people have told me, um, some of the main ones are an interest in traditional Japanese art forms, uh, especially performing arts like no or kagura, um, interest in shrines or in Japanese religions more generally, um, an interest in history. I had an interviewee who told me she became a priest because she wanted, she thought about where she could touch the oldest things and she decided shrines was where the oldest things were. Um, also uh, experience serving as a miko when they're younger um, can be a formative experience in wanting to enter the priesthood. And then finally, a sort of interesting category is people who have had experience living overseas and that experience of being a foreigner reinforced their Japanese-ness, their sense of Japanese-ness or their interest in Japan. And they decided 
to study something that they felt was essentially Japanese. Now, this is just from my interview data. So this is probably not at all representative. We unfortunately don't have statistics for the whole priesthood, um, but this is the breakdown in terms of people I've interviewed. You'll notice that it's mostly people from shrine families um, with a pretty even split actually of people from ordinary families and people who married in. Now, if we wanna talk about how female priests imagine themselves and their own roles, we have to talk about a sort of complicated thing, which is the language that they use. Um, specifically, when I ask my interviewees, have you ever had problems because you are a female priest? Um, they will often come up with a laundry list of issues. They uh, were sexually harassed. They uh, had someone turn them away when they came to do a ground purification ceremony. They have had problems with their parishioners being rude to them or treating them poorly because of their gender. They will come up with this whole list. And then I'll ask, have you ever experienced gender discrimination? And they say, no. Um, and instead, they tend to describe these experiences as Japan being a male society or uh, the shrine world being a male society. They say that the shrine world is male centric or shrines are male centric. They describe it as dan son juhi, which is a uh, Confucian phrase, which refers to revere men and treat women as base. Um, they say that the shrine world is feudalistic or that it's stuck in the Showa period. Um, so the sort of language of time lag. Additionally, many of them will agree that, the, that they are treated differently because of their gender. And then they will say that it is necessary and important. So this is a quote from a young woman named Hori Isan. Um, she is a graduate of Kogakan University, one of the two Shinto universities. She's in her 20s. Although she graduated because she's not from a shrine family, she was unable to find employment as a priest after graduation. And she says, because I am a woman, there are many things that cannot be helped. And so she describes that while in society there are lots of ideas about gender equality, shrines aren't like that. And she says, because the other party are, are kami, the deities, um, there are certain portions you can't be lenient about. Since I learned about that in college, I have no resistance to it. So I don't want to say here that female priests are mischaracterizing their own experiences or they're victims of false consciousness. What I do want to draw attention to is the language that people are using um, and the ways that they're viewing the world. Um, they are not comfortable describing their experiences as gender discrimination or else they're not comfortable describing them as gender discrimination to me specifically. Um, but they do have this sense that there is a disconnect in the way that male priests and female priests are treated that is specifically because of their gender. So as a result, female priests tend not to use language about gender equality. Instead, they use very similar language to what Jinjo Honcho uses. So they talk about leveraging their special char characteristics or what they can do specifically because they're women. So I ask my interviewees, are there things female priests are worse at than male priests? And they only ever come up with two things. The first is physical labor. They say men are better at lifting heavy things. Um, and the second is ceremonies that are performed outside of the shrine, like ground purification ceremonies, which they say are socially easier for men to perform. Women may get questions, they may be mistaken for Miko. Then I ask, are there things female priests are better at than male priests? and they come up with an incredibly long list. So interacting with locals, especially children and the elderly, ceremonies involving children, being kind, soft and detail oriented, understanding the feelings of mothers, seeing things from a mother's perspective, cleaning, cooking and other household chores. And these categories remain true across my interviewees, regardless of their, gen regardless of their age, regardless of their geographical location, um, regardless of their experience giving birth to children and raising them. I want to also point out that the things that female priests are good at all fall 
very neatly into the categories of additional duties that they might have to do at small shrines. If you're good at cleaning and housework, taking care of the shrine grounds is gonna be so much easier for you. If you are used to uh, balancing a household budget or you're very detail oriented, doing shrine administration is gonna be very easy. If you are really good at interfacing with the locals, then doing that kind of community outreach is going to be much easier for you than it would otherwise. So this is a quote from Nakajima Tatsuno, who actually recently was the uh, president of the National Female Priest Association. But this is in 1981, there was a round table in Beiten, which is a uh, ritual technique magazine. And she's saying here, after all, serving as a priest while leveraging one's womanliness as a woman without forgetting that leanness. If you don't study that, it's bad, isn't it? So I think we should study how to leverage that and perform a type of ministry that only women can perform, that makes parishioners think, oh, I'm glad it was a female priest. So you have here this idea, men and women are essentially different, but rather than womanhood as being something that makes women inferior or that has to be managed, those essential differences are actually something that they can bring that are benefits to the priesthood because men can't do them. Women are there to complement male priests, right? Now, I have to talk, unfortunately, here about what the downsides of this sort of strategic gender essentialism are. Um, first of all, female priest value to the priesthood is directly tied to gender norms, which means that their distance from or proximity to normative womanhood directly affects their self-evaluation. And this leads to a couple of things. First of all, for some female priests, being a priest has prevented them from having a normative life trajectory. So for example, one of my interviewees is one of those sole successor narratives. She's the only daughter of a priest family. Um, and she was actually engaged to get married, but her parents told her, we will not allow you to marry this man unless he is willing to take your last name and marry into the family. This is possible to do in Japan, but is rare. Um, and he refused and they broke off the, the marriage um, and she was unable to get married. Um, and so she really strongly feels that her being a priest has wound up preventing her from having this sort of normal life trajectory. And so often the tension between what female priests perceive as their duties as a priest and their duties as a woman can cause pretty intense emotional distress or lowered self-evaluation. And it's worth noting that women who fit into those Dinja Honcho categories of women who become priests in order to protect their family shrines often tend not to feel that kind of dissonance. Whereas people who don't fit into those narratives who have wound up entering the priesthood and then because of it have been unable to get married or have had a harder time having children or have had children but haven't been able to perform the type of housewife norm that is expected of them. They can't be home during New Year's. They, can't, uh, they aren't necessarily around on weekends for their children. They often will feel this sort of intense dissonance and this uh, friction between those two roles. And then the second point is that performing gender incorrectly winds up reducing women's uh, female priests value to the shrine world, which means that there is fairly intense gender policing uh, in the shrine world, men policing women, women policing each other, and women policing themselves. Um, because if your value is directly related to how well you fit into this very narrow normative womanhood, it means that you must fit or else. Um, so there can be, this goes back to the emotional distress. If you are uh, not getting married or if you are not having a child or if you are performing femininity in the wrong way, if you're wearing too much makeup, um, you might get stomped on quite hard or you might experience that intense sense of shame or of not being able to contribute uh, what you should be able to as a female priest. So to sum up, um, 
looking at our two narratives. Shinto institutions marginalize female priests. Female priests exist to fill a deficit in male labor. Um, female priests are essentially different than men and therefore female priests are inferior. Um, and female priest womanhood needs to be managed. On the other hand, from female priest perspective, they couch their participation in the priesthood in the language of strategic gender essentialism. So women are essentially different than men, but they're not necessarily inferior. Female priest special characteristics complement those of male priests and how or whether female priest womanhood is managed depends on the context. So what does this tell us about gender in religion or gender in Japan? Um, a couple of takeaways that I want you to go home with today. Um, first of all, more women does not necessarily mean more gender equal. Often people talk about gender parity, but in this case, um, what more women meant stronger gender differentiating because in 1971, when there were more women in the priesthood, suddenly there was an intense need to start differentiating more strongly and by creating that uh, differentiated ritual technique. Second of all, uh, a pretty obvious point, but different types of materials tell different stories. I was able to tell two stories today. I'm going to tell many more in my dissertation and there are many more that can be told but there are two stories that are told from substantially different vantage points. And then my last two points are related, which is that often when we talk about uh, women in conservative religious traditions, we want to either tell a story of oppression or a story of resistance. So either women are being oppressed by a patriarchal religion or women are valiantly resisting a patriarchal tradition. And I think that that binary winds up concealing a lot more than it reveals. Um, and so I want us to set that aside and to instead of trying to listen for the sort of perfect resistance, uh, I want to pay attention to imperfect modes of survival. And by that, I mean that marginalized people create space for themselves within institutions that are hostile to their existence, but through methods that validate or reinscribe the logic of their marginalization. And this is something that other scholars have talked about. Famously, Sabah Mahmoud talks about it with uh, women in Islam, but we are seeing a rise in people calling on Sabah Mahmoud in Japanese studies. So Levy McLaughlin, Jessica Starling, and Mark Rowe have all written about this um, with women in Soka Gakkai and women in Buddhism. Um, but in this case, we can see that female priests are within this institution that's fairly hostile to them um, and sees them as inferior and they're carving out space for themselves. Um, but they're doing that not by negating the negative things that are said about them, but rather by taking them and twisting them and reinterpreting them um, and saying, yes, we are essentially different, but that is actually our strength. Um, but by doing that, they are validating that very gen narrow gender norm and they're fitting themselves into these really intensely small boxes um, with not much wriggle room and not really contesting that kind of logic that is putting them in those boxes in the first place. So the takeaway that I want you to have is that sometimes we need to pay attention to the ways that people are surviving those kinds of very intense, desperate, hostile situations. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean valorizing that, but it does mean empathizing with the sort of very difficult trade-offs that people are having to make. Um, and that is it from me. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I look forward to your questions and comments.